We could say that the whole reason why God became man and Jesus came to earth was for the forgiveness of sins. John the Baptist prepared the way for Christ by pointing out Jesus as the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world and these are the same words we use at Mass. He proclaimed to the people loud and clear in the desert, Repent, for the kingdom of God is close at hand. His baptism was a sign of being healed and forgiven from sin. The angels in the Nativity story announced to the shepherds that this was a saviour that is born to you. Now this salvation was to be none other than freedom from sin at the heart of which is repentance and subsequent forgiveness. At the Last Supper Jesus said, and we repeat at every Mass the words, This is my body given up and my blood poured out for the forgiveness of sins. And of course, after the resurrection, he appeared to the disciples and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. Those whose sins you forgive, they are forgiven. Those whose sins you retain, they are retained. At these words, Jesus instituted the sacrament of penance, whereby priests are commissioned to forgive sins in Jesus' name. It is one of the seven sacraments and is also mentioned in the Nicene Creed, which we say at every Sunday at Mass. Jesus himself, of course, forgave his executioners from the cross with the words, Father, forgive them, they know not what they do. Of course, the meaning of the passion and death of Jesus is that we would he would stand in the place of the guilty, that is, us, and atone for our sins, justifying us before the Father, making us righteous, releasing us from the stranglehold of sin, saving us from the power of the devil, and opening up the way to eternal life where sin will be no more. Barabbas and Jesus have the same name, Son of the Father. Here Barabbas stands for us. The guilty Barabbas, that's us, is reprieved. And in our place, the innocent Jesus is condemned. The innocent Lamb of God is condemned in place of the guilty. It's a bit like St. Maximilian Kolbe, who offered to take the place of a family man who was sentenced to be hung in Auschwitz in 1944. Jesus has done the same for us. The core of the teaching of Jesus is the mercy of God, which is given to us when we repent of our sins. Stories such as the prodigal son, the lost sheep, Zacchaeus, the transformation of Mary Magdalene, the forgiveness of Peter after his denial, the good thief, all these are at the very heart of the mission of Jesus. He said, I came to call sinners to repentance. What Jesus is saying is that there is a way to break the power which sin has over us and that is in and through him. That's all very fine, but we too have an important part to play in claiming and making this forgiveness of Christ effective in our lives. The first words of John the Baptist, the first words of Jesus, the first words of Peter at Pentecost are repent. Without repentance on our part, there is no forgiveness. The merits of Christ's passion and resurrection are applies to us at baptism, but we must activate them. We don't, of course, earn our own salvation, but we must claim it for, for ourselves in order for it to take effect in our souls. We first of all must call sin by its proper name, own it and confess it, preferably and especially if it is serious in the sacrament of penance. These days we see long queues for Holy Communion, but a minuscule number for confession in comparison. What is that saying? Did sin go out of fashion with Vatican II in the 1960s? Has the modern world since the 60s lost its sense of sin. People often glibly say that Jesus accepts us as we are. Yes, he loves us so much that he doesn't want to, us to have any truck with sin. We must change, he is saying, if we want to bask in the forgiveness which he has won for us on the cross. A good bit of advice is that we, is that we must hate the sin and love the sinner, and that includes sin in ourselves. Jesus may accept us as we are, but he sure doesn't want us to stay the where we are if we're playing around with, with sin. Humility means that we own up to our sins head on, 
and beat our breasts. I think the confiteor in the new mass mentions us having greatly sinned, which a lot of people seem to frown on these days. One of the great blockages to the mercy and forgiveness of God in our lives is when we refuse to forgive our neighbour and hand, harden our hearts against him or her. This is brought out in the parable of the unforgiving servant. God can't forgive us if we stubbornly refuse to forgive others. In the one prayer Jesus gave us it says, Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. I would say that the greatest need in the church today is for people to face up to the reality of sin in their lives. And when the church says that something is against the law of God, we must stop putting our own personal spin on the teaching. How can we be forgiven if we are trying to downplay its reality? Living together, despite what a lot of Catholics say these days, is a sin. Abortion is a sin. Contraception is a sin. Laziness is a sin. Impure thoughts and actions are sins. Missing mass through negligence is a sin. We ask Mary, as we say in the Hail Mary, to pray for us sinners. We need her prayers. We are going to repent. Our Lady of Fatima asked the children to add a rosary to the rosary the following. O oh Jesus, forgive us our sins and save us from the fires of hell. Lead all souls to heaven especially those who are most in need of your mercy. That says it all. Someone once said to Padre Pio, that Saint Padre Pio, that he didn't believe in hell. The Saint answered, you will when you go there. But don't forget, when our sins are forgiven, they are no more. God will never call them again to mind. Thank you all for watching and God bless you all. Oh